Why don't you stand and we'll worship together?
Glory to your name, Lord. Glory to your name, Lord. We give you glory. We give you glory in your open heaven. Thank you for the open heaven, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Well, while the rest of the people are still coming in, we welcome you all that are here to come forward and you can occupy some of these that have names on them that the people aren't here. Just make yourselves at home. Come on, come closer. And we welcome Dr. Sam Matthews to come to the platform and obey God. Hallelujah. Don't you appreciate this man? Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Yeah, it looks right as a person yawning. All right. <laughs> Amen. Well, our God's a good God, right? Amen. Amen. And I thank God for the privilege of being here. I thank God for the privilege of being alive and just to know Him and to be able to have an opportunity to be involved in His kingdom. So it's a very special privilege to be able to just be with God's people. And God's given me a great opportunity to be with a lot of God's people all around the earth. And it's a great delight. And it was I was excited to hear that we're even having communion here, is that right? Yeah, so I was excited. I love to be able to have communion with people in various nations, with various ethnicities and cultures, and it's just always a very, very special time to be able to do that. Okay, so we've all come to be further touched by the Word of God, amen, and by the Spirit of God, and you guys are a bunch of hungry people that I, I appreciate hungry people. In fact, one of the things that God told me years ago when I came out of a what Kathy and I refer to as six months locked up with God. And it was in 1981, and we found, thank you, we found ourselves being moved to Shawnee, Oklahoma. I was going to be there for just a little while and uh, didn't plan on staying. I've been there now, what, 35 years. That's, 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 that's a short while, right? So it means I'm going to live to be really old. That's what that means. So I went there for a little while. And so, but God said, I have some things I want to teach you, was number one thing. You can be near your family for a while. Kathy's mother and her sister and husband and young child live there. And since then, uh, we've just seen God open up so many things. But in that six-month period, one of the things that God told us after changing us in so many ways and opening us up to more of a life of intercession and more understanding of spiritual warfare and battling things in the spirit realm and again just being visited by Jesus it was a very very special time but one thing that he said was this he said I'm going to put you with hungry people and hungry people with you so I appreciated God doing that because there's, there's nothing worse than being a hungry person with a bunch of people that don't want to be hungry amen so you guys are hungry and that makes it easy and you guys draw on the presence of God and you want to receive so that makes it easy for us to be able to release the things that God uh, has given us, and I just appreciate that. So let's just have a prayer. Father, I thank you so much that you've given us Jesus. Father, we thank you that we are hungry people and have gathered together this day to receive from you. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are the great teacher. So we welcome you, we recognize you, we honor you as the great teacher. So you give us the insight, you give us the things that come deeply from your spirit. We just want to thank you that you bring truth, revelation, insight, power unto your people this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Several months ago, probably it's been a year, I talked to somebody today that told me that it's been two or three years since something else has happened. And so time goes by. How many of you feel like time goes by really quickly? All right, I heard it all my life. The older you get, the faster it goes. Seems to be true. And somewhere along the line, all of my time ran together. Siggy was talking about time today. It just all crashed together, and everything seems like it happened yesterday or today, or maybe it's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know. Read Ecclesiastes, and we can find out. Okay. So the reality is that God has so many things that he wants us to know and so many truths that he wants to give us. And I... And being somebody that was hungry and wanted to hear from the Father, I would ask God a lot of questions. And I began to ask him, God, what are you saying? We learned that in 1975 when Kathy was ill. 
And God was just first taking us into a life of faith and intercession and began to change so many things in us. We didn't know what was happening, but if he's the master, then he has all the answers. Everybody say amen. And if, he, if he's the shepherd and we're the sheep and the sheep hear the shepherd's voice, that must mean that the shepherd's going to say something to the sheep. Amen. So I loved it, all right, to understand that prayer was something that just wasn't something where I talked to God a lot and wondered what he was going to do, but it was something where I could listen to God and he would speak and that the word was living it was active, it was sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, and I just kept asking God, okay, God, what are you saying? So, in, in that process of that six months, I further heard, would hear and receive things from the Father, and I don't know about you, but I, I would like to know every shortcut or secret that I could find. Any of you ever find that? I found out that I found a lot of shortcuts that's taken me 40 years to have them worked out. All right, you got that, all right. So... Anyway, I thought, okay, God, give me some secrets. I mean, if I'm really going to live this life of faith and if I'm really going to accomplish all the things that you've shown me in vision and dream and picking us up and taking us place, if you're going to accomplish all of those things, how are you going to do that? Show me because I, I have to know more than what I know today. I have to have more than what I have today, so please. And I would ask him all these questions, and he would started waking me up in the middle of the night I would start hearing book, chapter, verse, and I would get up and I would look at it. I would or wake up hearing a word from God, and I would get up and then look up the word and study it or, you know, just a variety of things. Right? I'd wake up hearing songs, and, and I'd hear angels singing and visitations of angels and visitations of demons and just, okay, God, what are you saying? Give me these insights from, from these things. But in that six-month period, I found myself going through a time where I did not sleep more than 10 minutes at a time. I didn't realize that until I started living through it. But I, if God would say something, then I would be awake, obviously, and I would look at it and spend some time. And then if I would go back to sleep after a period, then within 10 minutes, I was awake. And I began to realize I can't sleep more than 10 minutes, day or night, whenever it was. Whenever I would finish hearing what God was saying researching and studying what he was giving, then I would be tired. And I would go to sleep, but in 10 minutes I was up hearing again. And it was a life-changing period. But I learned during that time that you can not sleep a lot and not die. Everybody say amen. Amen. And so I don't sleep a lot, and uh, I get interrupted a lot by God. But if I'm going to get interrupted, I'd like to be by God. Amen. I used to have demons that would call me. You know, have you ever gotten calls in the middle of the night where people call you and are cursing you and all that kind of stuff? And I'd be mad, you know, because they'd, they'd wake me up, and it, would, it was not a good thing. So one day God said, why are you mad? And they just, just realize, tell, start telling the devil, every time you wake me up, I'm going to go back in the presence of God. And the, the calls stopped. Amen. So if I get any calls, I'll know it's from one of you in this room. <laughs> okay. All right, so 10 minutes. But anyway, it was, it was life-changing in what God was doing. But he did. He gave me some insight, gave me a secret, gave me a scripture where it says that we're being changed to the very image of Jesus Christ. Do you guys believe that here? Amen. I mean, we're going from glory to glory, being changed into the very image of Jesus Christ. In other words, we can look at a lot of people. We can look at people's lives. We can see what somebody did, what they didn't do. But the thing is that the Holy Spirit's task is that he's in the process of changing us into the image of the Christ. So if the Christ is the Christ, and he's the Messiah, and he's the Lord, and he's our Savior, and he's the one that brought us into right relationship with God, then with all that being like it is, then I need to become like him. So that's the secret. So God, however you did it in Jesus, and however he yielded to you, I want to learn those things so that you can do by the power of your spirit the same things that you did in Jesus. And in the revelation that God would give to Reese Howells about the spirit, one of the great things about the spirit was that God was looking for men and women who would so open themselves up to become totally possessed by the Holy Spirit. Now, I knew what demon possession was, and I knew it means if somebody's possessed, they're not in control. Something else is in control. So when I read that chapter in the book that, wow, it was like you do the best you can. That was what I was taught. As a Christian, you do the best you can. You try to learn Scripture. You try to hide it in your heart. You try to be good and not be bad. Uh, but to realize that I could be possessed by the Holy Spirit 
it was a, it was a concept that I thought, that's just incredible. That the same life, that was the revelation, the same life that the Holy Spirit lived in Jesus is the same life that the Holy Spirit is wanting to live through every person who will totally yield themselves to the Father. That the same results, and that's what salvation is, bringing the same results inside of us. That Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, if Jesus was walking where you walk today, where I walk today, that the Holy Spirit would live the very same life through us that he would have lived through Jesus and did live through Jesus as he walked on the earth. That's the greatest news we can possibly have. Because that means it's not based on my trying. It's based on the power and the victory of the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the person of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say amen. 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 So my heart, God, I, wanna, I want to know more. How did your Holy Spirit do these things through Jesus? And so God began, does what? He takes me to the Word again. So I would wake up hearing these verses. And he started me on this pilgrimage. And the first verse I want to go to tonight would be John chapter 4, verse 32. Very, very powerful verse of Scripture that begins to give us insight or, or understanding into the life of Jesus, into the keys or the secrets or those things, shortcuts, if you would say, but look at verse chapter 4, verse 32. Jesus said this, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Just let that one sink in just a little bit. Now, this was a setting with a woman at the well. Disciples had gone off to get some food because they were hungry. Jesus engages the lady, all those things that transpire. But when the disciples come back, they have food. And Jesus goes, well, okay, not quite interested in food right now. And, and he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. And God just caused that to explode inside of my spirit that I have something to give you that's not the natural. And then I remembered it. He took me on over into the 18th chapter, I think it is, of the Gospel of John, where Jesus said, no, uh, my kingdom is not of this realm. And when you realize that Jesus pulled from the realm of the Father, that he had perfect relationship with the Father, and Jesus was giving a key. He said, if you're going to become what I want you to become, if you're going to do the same works I did as well as greater works, you're going to have to become just like I am. And he said, I eat things that you don't eat. And I just want us all to determine today, and it became a cry of my heart, God, I want to eat the food that comes out of heaven. Because, see, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. That was an analogy, it's a symbol, it's a whatever, all those kind of things that you read about in theology books, etc. And people try to put Jesus out there somewhere. This is what he's like. No, Jesus Christ is bread. He's bread. And his blood is wine. And I mean, and, 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 you know, his wine is the blood and all of these things. And we're to drink it, we're to eat of it. In other words, there's a spiritual substance that comes out of the heavenly realm that God wants us to partake of. Well, we can't just be mere humans caught up in the activities of life and all of those things and distracted and go running into the presence of God a little bit and say, okay, God, I'll quickly read my Bible and I'll put in my daily time with you. And No, it, it's this heart that says, God, I want to be fed food that most people don't know about. Now, that doesn't make you important. It just means you're a person that's keyed in that God has something that's from a spiritual dimension. And we know the things are discerned. They're, they're spiritually discerned. They're not naturally discerned. So there's a spiritual food. There's a spiritual reality. There's, there's an air to breathe that comes out of the mouth of the Christ and out of the mouth of the Father that goes into our lungs, that touches our whole being, that changes us into that bread, that changes the life of God into every one of us. And, and so that's what God is after. So we have to get in our mind this concept. Okay, Jesus said, I have food to eat you don't know about. So if we accept that, that's what made him different. And I said, I think I said it yesterday in the, in the message, but in Hebrews chapter 11, that whole roll call of the faithful, one day God asked me a question. He said, Sam, what, what made these people different? I said, I don't know, God, what made them different? He said, they either heard something Nobody else heard, or they saw something nobody else saw. And you read it by faith. They, they heard, they saw. So, again, it was one of those moments where God speaks, and he said, so if you're going to do the extraordinary, if you're going to live in that realm of the Spirit, then you're going to have to see what other people don't see. 
You're going to have to hear what other people don't hear. Now, everything you hear in any testimony that Kathy and I give of our lives is the fact that, that every leading was something we heard or we read. It was something we saw. It was a vision. It was a dream. It was a, a word of God. It was the voice of the master. It was the quickening of the spirit. It was, in other words, it was this rhema of God that was God-breathed, that was past our intellect, not our understanding, all right? But it, it, was, it was something was birthed by God. It was breathed out by the Spirit of God. I mean, those things, well, Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost as a mighty rushing wind and tongues of fire and all those kind of things. Well, I heard most of the preaching, well, that's what it was like. It, that's the way they could describe it. That's No, it was wind. It was the breath of God. It was the power of God. It was the fire of God. He's a consuming fire. And he went dance, dancing around on people's heads. And I thought, you know, I want to have God dance around on my head. Amen. I mean, you know, why not? Why not? 1975, when Kathy was so ill, she got to the place she couldn't go into services. And I went to a service one night, and when I came home, I walked into our living room, and on one end, we had a hanging lamp that was on, and she was on the other end of the couch, and she was glowing. She was yellow, goldish, translucent. I thought, is she dying? I'd never seen a glowing person. I had no reference to know what is a glowing person. Are they coming? Are they going? Is she experiencing God or what? And I walked, I walked, I said, I just stopped. I couldn't even walk into the room. I stopped. And I said, Kathy, are you okay? And she goes, yes, I'm fine. She said, you're not going to believe what happened. I said, probably not. All right. I don't know what's happening right now. And she's glowing. I mean, she's beautifully alive and, and golden and translucent. It was, it was great. She said, I had an urge I ha to go to the bathroom, okay? Now, she's sick. She's got diarrhea. Her insides are rotting out and all kinds of things that are happening. And, and she said, I went to the bathroom, and she said, I passed this big, huge gray mass. And I said, did you keep it? She said, no, I flushed it. I got rid of it. It was ugly, you know, but it was transforming, okay? Now, my point is this. We live in a realm that's not based on just the natural. It's a realm that we eat of things that's not of this world. We eat of a realm. It is a spiritual realm that God is trying to bring to the earth. We pray it. We've heard people talk about it today. The reality that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it's being done in heaven. In other words, that which is in heaven needs to come down here. So when heaven touches us, facts don't count. Amen. When, when, when heaven touches us, everything begins to change. So Jesus said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. So I said, God, I want to eat of that food. Well, then you get to reading in Scripture and you find about one of the things that happens with the overcomers. They get to eat of hidden manna. Oh, man, does that excite you? I want to eat some hidden manna. All right, those guys ran around the wilderness for all those years and got, God fed them with manna from heaven. And one of the promises is, okay, you be faithful, you walk, you become that overcomer. Then what I'm going to do is bring you into that position where I'm going to feed you that food of heaven that's going to change you into the very image of Jesus Christ. So, and what's that going to be? It's the Word. It's the Christ. It's that living reality of everything that he is that's being spoken and everything about that. He's going to speak in that way. Well, then he goes on and he says, let's look down at the next verse would be 34. And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. In other words, Jesus said, my will, my desire is to do the will of him who sent me. My work, that, that's what I'm to do. So something inside of me embraced this thing of God. I don't want to do anything except what your work and your will is. I just want to know what you want me to do. And I want to know it every moment. I don't want to know it in some kind of generality. I want to be led by the Spirit. I want to walk by the Spirit. I want to have insight by the Spirit. I want to have this communication with you. One of the great revelations that God gave me many years later was that Jesus Christ spent the first 30 years of his life fellowshipping with the Father. 
And watch the great revelation that we get from Jesus about God, Father. Wow. And it, it put this hunger in me. I, I just want to fellowship with the Father. I don't just want to go do something. I don't just want to go preach. I just don't want to go minister. I really want to know the Father. Well, then you find out that Jesus said in John 17, verse 1, or verse 3, he said this, and this is eternal life, that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. In other words, the greatest desire inside of us should be to know the Father like Jesus Christ knew the Father. Because that's why he was one with the Father. He didn't know a little bit about the Father. We get a little bit of anointing. We get a little bit of understanding. We go charging out there to the world to do something. And, and when we get so caught up, and we all know the stories, so bad stories of people that get lots of anointing and their character cannot maintain it, and they fall and they falter. You know why they do that? Because they don't know the Father. Because, man, if you know the Father... You're not going to fall for some of those things. Everybody say amen. Because you're going to love the Father. You're going to love Him. And because you love Him, you're going to want to obey Him. You're going to want to be faithful to everything the Father's doing. So Jesus said, look, this is what I want. He said, my, this, this is my work. I, I want to do what the Father wants me to do. Go to chapter 5 and look at verse 17. John chapter 5, verse 17. But He answered, Jesus speaking again, My Father is working until now, and I myself and working. Look at 19. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself unless it is something He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Look at verse 30. I can do nothing. Okay, I'm emphasizing that. We read the same kind of word in the last verse, didn't we? I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, so here you have Jesus saying, I can't do anything unless I see the Father do it, unless I hear the Father say it. How many more prayers would we have answered in our lives if we would only pray the prayers that the Father speaks for us to pray why did jesus have the victories he had he, he didn't initiate anything how many of us we we like to initiate things and ask god to bless them we like to come up with ideas and say god deliver us and you know years ago god told me he said sam if you get into big trouble he said i'm never going to just get you out of trouble he said i'm not going to vindicate you he said i will only vindicate my word that is at work within you. Now, does that mean he doesn't love me? Does it mean he doesn't want to deliver you? No, no, no. That's not what it means at all. But what he's saying is, it's my word that is eternal. It is my word that is true. It is my word that is living and active and that's going to change you. So here, Jesus is saying, I don't initiate anything. God help us to have that kind of relationship with the Father that we don't have to say, well, I don't know what the Father's doing, so I have to make the best decision that I can make. Now, we ought to be led by the Spirit. Everybody say amen. 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 We need to be led by the Spirit. In other words, Jesus said, I do what I see. I say what I hear. And because that is the essence, that should be the very desire of our lives. And somebody, one of our teachers years ago, and after the 89 intercession that I relate a little bit of, and it goes it's so long to tell most of that story, but uh, after that intercession, and this person had been around for several years, and they came one day, they caught me in the hallway and in between their classes, and they said, Sam, I have one question. Why do you and Kathy always say yes to whatever God asks you to do yeah and I looked at the person I said I don't know I never thought about it like that why do I I just thought that's what you're supposed to do number one you know I'm just saying I don't know I don't know I said let me think about that a little bit 
And, and, and so I did. I thought about it a little bit. I mean, I didn't spend a lot of time praying about it, but it had come through my mind. And I said, God, why, why do I do that? And so a couple of days later, I caught that person in the hall, and I said, look, my answer is this. I love him. I just love him. Point blank, I love him. Like part of the story yesterday when God told me, he said, you don't have the faith to break this spirit of death. And he said, if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. Now, all of us know that verse. I knew that verse. But that day and over the next almost four months, that verse became unbelievably real inside of us. Now, I knew it was true, and I'd say amen to it beforehand. But after that almost four-month struggle and seeing her come right to the point of death and going into comas, I mean, it was an incredible kind of thing. We had binding devils and, and coming against principalities and powers and being threatened to be killed. and I mean, in, incredible things that were happening. But in the midst of all of that, the thing that we began to see was the fact that the only reason she's alive is because we didn't try to save her life. That's the first thing your humanity wants to do. That's my wife. I don't want her to die. It's my wife. It's not right for those demons and those principalities, worse than demons, principalities and powers, those ruling rulers doing what they're doing and coming in that way and trying to negate and trying to keep the God of this world that's blind to the minds of those unbelieving, trying to keep them bound. And No, God, you put us on this track. Why? Because that's what he asked. Because I signed on to this thing from the standpoint of realizing that, hey, I've been bought with a price. The blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not my own, and we, we, we'll all say amen to it, but it's real. I'm not my own. I belong to him. And whatever he asks you to engage in, wherever he sends you, it's just like many times Christians get so upset and bothered about, man, why didn't, you know, God, keep the devil away from me. And the devil attacks me here. He does this. He does that. You were sent into the world to destroy the works of the devil. Somebody amen that. Amen. amen. Jesus Christ was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. And if Jesus Christ lives inside of you, then you become one that is to be sent into those places where the devil has ruled to see that those strongholds are brought down, that those bondages are broken, that the strong men are bound so that people, so that cities, and so that regions and nations can be set free by the power of God. We went into Bangladesh some of us years ago, and went, it took, I won't go through how long it took us to get there, but it was quite a journey through various kinds of means, means of transportation and and when we got in there and were the first people that had gotten into this village, no one was born again. And, and while we were there, one of the things that happened, there was this, they were held by a strange animistic spiritualist cult kind of thing that had been there for centuries. And the guy that was the main witch doctor guy wore a, a turban on his head. And he's there in this council and we're all there and we're getting ready to preach the gospel. And one of our guys leans over me and says, do you feel evil coming out of that man? I said, yes. He says, does that bother you? I said, no. I said, that's why we were sent here to touch that and to break that because they have been bound all these centuries by that fa fallacy and that, fa yeah, whatever it is. Saki. Shikinamahata. Whatever Hallelujah. Wow. What I've just seen is those intercessions and those things that were released at that point. God just absolutely re-injected, re-injected into those things, re-injected into those intercessions, re-injected into the eternality of the declarations that were being made to release that one more time. And I'm seeing the power of God run through those hills, run through those valleys, run into those villages. Father, release the power. 
that's in your word. Release the power of those intercessions. Release the power, oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I began in that, that whole thing, I began to see how... When we left that village, anyway, 90% of that village accepted Jesus. 270 people accepted Jesus. They sent me that following Christmas. Our workers sent us it for the first time in the history and centuries that those tribes have been there. For the first, you know, it's like National Geographic verses. I'm just seeing this thing. I'm living in this thing. Whew. Whew. They wrote me and said for the first time at Christmas time, they're praising Jesus Christ, God's lamb that was sent for their salvation. How I rejoiced when I got that email. How I rejoiced. But what I was seeing a while ago was the re-injecting of those intercessions being released by the Spirit of God. Because God's word's living and eternal. So if you make a declaration of his word anywhere along the line, that's an eternal word that never, ever, ever is negated is always there waiting for that, re, re, right, right now I'm saying, a re-engagement of those things by the power in His presence. And I began to see in the midst of all of that, when we left that village and we're coming off, as we we're going down these mountains and through the valleys and up and down and going through streams and wading through water and all kinds of interesting things, as we, were, as we were going through those things, we began to declare the Word of God. We began to declare that all the families of the nations are being gathered together by the Spirit of God, that they're all coming to worship and to magnify. I mean, verse after verse after verse. Well, when we left a couple of weeks after we were gone, the, the thing that happened I received too, that a tribe down off this one tribe that we were in in, in village was on the top of this one hill, mountain, and they went through the valley and go up another mountain and down another valley, and you go up another mountain and down another valley, there's another tribe. And these tribes had never intermingled a different, a different tribe than what this other one was. And so uh, they, they, they sent a delegation from that tribe three mountains away. They sent a delegation to this tribe and said, we were, we were told that if we would come here, you would explain to us about a man named Jesus. Is that incredible? That's what God just released again in the hill tracks of Bangladesh where a million people did not know Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Woo! Yeah, that was nice. I enjoyed that. Yes. Woo! Wow. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We love you. Hallelujah. I have no idea where we were. We were somewhere... We were talking about God. Amen? Yes. Okay. And about his food. We're, man, we're sent to manifest. Yeah. Jesus was sent. He was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. My mind is engaged somewhere. Woo! So, he, don't, don't worry about it when you run into devils. <laughs> God knows where you are. Amen. Amen. Flo Eller's over here. First time I went to Juneau, Alaska. I didn't know Juneau, Alaska. First time I ever went on a trip before I started going to the nations. The first time I ever, you know, ever went anywhere. And you, you, you can't get into Juneau, Alaska. You couldn't except by air or by water. And uh, so we got in there. And when I got off the plane, demons, demons everywhere. And God had been showing us. And we'd been having visitations by angels, by the Christ, by demons, all kind of spiritual warfare things. And anyway, when we got there, I've seen all these demons, and they had me in a nice garage apartment, and everything was cool. And, and they said goodbye. And as they were saying goodbye to me, they said, now we want to take you to the end of the road. Because in Juneau, you go one direction, the road ends about 25 miles out. You run into forest. The other way you go, you run into water. It's just, you're just like, you're, you're stuck. All right, and uh, I'd never been anywhere where I'm stuck, okay? But anyway, so she leaves and said, well, I'll take you to the end of the road before we leave. And so anyway, so right after she leaves, the phone rings, and it's somebody else's apartment, and they left there so I could have it. It was a nice new garage apartment, and very lovely place to stay. And, and this guy, I pick up the phone, this guy starts cursing me. I mean, calling me everything in the world and calling to me. He's going to make all kind of threats and and I'm saying, sir, I, I'm, I'm a guest here. I'm, yeah, we know who you are, and we don't want you here, and you need to leave. And I'm thinking, you don't know who I am. No, we know who you are, and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and it scared me. 
because I'm stuck. I don't know how to get out of there, okay? I know one person in Juneau, Alaska, is Flo Ellers. I'd met her one time before. I'm thinking, who is this person? All right, what does she get me into? I don't have any idea, all right? So anyway, I'm, so when I put down the phone, I'm kind of shaking, and the guy's made these threats, and I'm wondering, wow, what's going to happen? And I say, my favorite question, God, what do you say? What do you, what do you have to say about this? And I heard so clearly Psalm 61. So I turned into my Bible to Psalm 61. It says this, when your heart is faint, And you're at the end of the earth. I thought, he knows where I am. I'm at the end of the road. I am literally for the first time in my life at the end of the earth. Woo! And God knows it. Gave me faith. Amen? Yeah. It was great. All right, so you don't need to worry about it. Well, I go to sleep. You had to pull out the couch to make a bed and... So I did that, and in the night I'm awakened. The room is hot. It's filled, and I look up, and there's demons. Demons, like on choir risers. Fill that little apart. Demons everywhere. And I'm looking at that, and they're threatening, and they're saying things, and they're like a choir of evil. And I'm going, this is kind of freaky. And I start looking at them, and I'm thinking, now see, for months, I'd been being visited by demons, Right? And these things had been coming against us to get us to stop. And the whole understanding was that, wow, I started looking and I thought, I've seen that one before. And then I went to, I've seen that one before. And then I, I've seen that, that I, I thought, I've seen all of you. God has already shown me and engaged his spirit through me in you. And you're already defeated, so you guys have to leave. And they just packed up and left the whole thing. And I was like, man, this is impressive. I'm some kind of faith guy. Amen? Yeah. All right. Anyway. Whoa. Wow, I'm still back there in Bangladesh, man, going up and down those hills. That was one of the intercessions for Bangladesh that God gave me one night in 1989 when Kathy was so sick and I was up and God said, I'm going to give you four more nations. I said, no, God, she's about to die now. I don't want any more nations. I don't want any more demons. I don't want any more principalities. These are about to take us down. You've already told me I don't have faith to do this. And now you're going to add more nations with more principalities and Bangladesh was one of them. But today, people that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, they know the gospel it was my first trip just before I didn't get a mad plan on getting in this story. It was my first trip to Bangladesh the weekend before we left that Kathy's lost sight in her left eye. Devil came in, bam, out in a matter of seconds. It's gone. My second trip to Bangladesh a little over a year later, her vision in her second eye goes out. Can't be a coincidence, can it? We got that vision back in that, right, that eye, and she continued. And then, then a couple of days before 9-11, she lost her sight. And for 13 years, she did not have sight. For 13 years, we stood believing that the power of principalities that blind the minds of the unbelieving, lest they would see. And then one day I was reading one of the guys, a big Iman from Hamas, gave a speech at a university, and he talked about how that every day on Friday, there even on the Temple Mount, where she has now walked when she was blind, and I had to almost have a fight with one of those guys up there who said, she can't touch me because she's a woman, I'm a guy. And I, I said, she can't see. He said, you can't touch her. I said, I don't care. I'm going to take her by the arm. So anyway, I thought he might do whatever, but anyway, God's a good God. Okay. So where was I on that? So I, this Imam guy, he, he gives this speech, and he says, every Friday in our prayer time, we pray for insanity. It was the time of the, when Ariel Sharon's brain blew up. Okay, you know, and he had that big stroke. It was that time frame. He said, every Friday we pray for Christians and the infidels to have brain hemorrhages. I read it. And for blindness to strike them and insanity to strike them. And something inside of me just said, yes, God, we're standing against those powers that so bind those individuals. Because, see, you have to not only see, you have to see what other people don't see. You have to hear what other people don't hear because he's taking us into these realms where we're going to touch things that other people have not touched. And we're going to break things where other people have not been able. You know, Jesus or Paul taught himself. He said, "Woo, I'm getting totally carried away here. Woo! 
Sheila Balhakovie. I don't know where I was there. I was going to say something about something. About what? I didn't hear that. Did you? So those those powers. He's engaging those things even now. Father, we're blessing you. Father, we're blessing you. So we have to see. We have to hear. We have to know because God is wanting us to stand against. And there's things. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. The things that... Uh, he, he will want us to stand against that have never, never been stood. Oh, Paul, Paul. Somebody said Paul. That's what you said, wasn't it? It wasn't, it wasn't registering in my brain. Uh, that uh, he said that some, some of you are weak and some of you are asleep because you haven't discerned properly the body of Christ. That's what I'm talking about. She would be dead if the Spirit of God by His grace had not allowed me to properly discern the body of Christ. Amen. So Father's got a date with us and has a destiny with us that are here that He's going to take us into this next realm, a new realm, to where we're going to see what other generations have not seen and we're going to hear what other people have not hear, heard. We're going to be able to engage those things that need to be engaged, those things that need to be pulled down by the grace and the power of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we would know then to be able to stand against those things. Because again, what you don't know, you can't stand firm against the schemes of the devil unless you know the schemes of the devil. Right? Okay. So one time in that 89 intercession when Kathy was again so ill and there was this certain symptom that came upon her that was, was strange. And, and it was just, it was, it was unrelenting. And I was in one room in the living room praying, walking, praying I'd, in the midst of a a 40-day fast was in the midst of that, and she, she ultimately she did not eat for 50 days, not because she was a fast, because she couldn't get any, if anything went in, nothing would come out, and any kind. It was just a very strange moment. But the realization is that that uh, I was saying something. Man, I'm going through those hills and mountains in Bangladesh. I love going through those places and shouting those praises. And I think I finished that story, didn't I? But what story was I on? She, one night, she's having this pain, and just every little bit, she's crying out in pain, crying out in pain, and I'm asking God. I can't, can't ask him to just take it away, because if I try to save her life, I'm going to lose it. That's what my humanity wants to do. God, just do something. But I couldn't, because if I try to save it, I'm going to lose it. But if I lose my life, in the intercessions for these nations that he puts upon me, then I'll save it. I'm in a race, in a race. You want to know how frightening that was night after I'm in a race with death. You want to know when my body screamed at me that I'm too exhausted to stay awake another second? You know what? I knew I was in a race, and I knew hell was not going to go to sleep, and hell was not going to go down, so I would walk all the more, and I would walk faster, and I would declare the word of God because I did not want to see death get to there first rather than life get to there. Because, yeah, not just I didn't want her to die, there's billions of people. This was 1989. You read some of the statistics. The massive numbers of more people, Muslims alike, and out of other nations that are now coming to Jesus Christ, it's the greatest moment in the history of the earth. And salvation and revival is the worst time also from that standpoint. But it's this incredible movement of the Spirit of God. So he was showing us those things by his life and by his grace. And those were the things we had to live for. That's what he's asking us to do. And I'll tell you another story about Samuel Howes because some of you are right now going, I don't know if I want to sign on for anything like that guy's talking about. You already did if you got saved. No, you already did. You already did. You just may not have known it, but you did. I didn't know it. I didn't know it until he started showing up and telling us. Then I knew it. 
then I begin to understand we are bought with a price. We don't indulge this. We have food to eat, food to eat that you don't know about. We have insight to gain that our humanity can't know. All these things. Well, one night, I got off my story. One night, this terrible pain that was hitting her, I went to my knees and I said, okay, God, just show me, show me, show me. What is it? What is it? What is the power? Well, I'd just been to a meeting a few weeks before, a Christian meeting, to speak and to share some things about intercession. And there was a lady there that just really bothered me. When she'd look at me, I'd think, I'm closing my eyes now so you won't think I'm looking at any of you. She, she'd look at me and I think, that woman's got the devil in her. And I would pray against some things. Anyway, didn't think about it after we left there. Well, that night when I went to my knees to say, okay, God, what are you saying? What I need to know. This is, this is debilitating, Father. Well, what I need to know, we're trying to break these powers. What power is causing that? That lady's face comes right up in front of me. Sneering, mocking. So I knew what to do. God said, okay, this, witchcraft. Witchcraft at a level, in the level of Oklahoma, has joined in this battle against those other principalities and powers to try to further bring that demise and stop these intercessions. The minute I addressed it in the name of Jesus Christ, bam, those cryings out that she was doing ended. I had to see what I couldn't see. I couldn't initiate it. We tried to initiate so much. No, let the Father initiate it. Let the Father show you. Let the Father reveal. Let the Father speak to you. That's the thing that he's after. That's the thing that he's wanting us to be able to enter into. Amen, amen. Is that good? Hallelujah. He's a good God. He's a good God. He's a good God. He's a very good God. Okay, initiate, initiate, initiate. We need to let him initiate everything. We need to let him know everything. And he knows everything, so he's going to tell us the things that we need to know. Now, this thing, when I shared yesterday about the whole thing with Michael and then with Gabriel, the further engagement that God is wanting us to have, the way that if those had to be engaged to come to bring the message to us, to, to Daniel, then those same angelic powers are going to need to be engaged to, to make it manifest within the earth. It just kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Hadn't thought about it for decades of time from that standpoint, but we know there are angels involved in those things. But it's just like, okay, everything's going to the next glory, the next dimension. Everything is going upward. Everything is coming into the realm where God's going to engage everything. And we know the angels are going to be involved in the great harvest and the great reaping of the earth. Is that not true? Absolutely. We know that. And it's not so much that we're going to boss them around. It's the fact that we're going to cooperate with them because they're getting orders straight from heaven. Amen? They're getting orders straight from heaven. Not to indulge that I can indulge my self-centeredness and my selfishness and my greed to get them to do something for me. But they're out to the harvest of the nations of the earth. And that's what God's wanting to do at this moment. So he's wanting to show us that. He's wanting us to reveal those things. And I, I've started seeing in, in the, the, the last couple of years, maybe more, now from the standpoint that when I go in from city to city and to do various conferences that I will begin to see these angels and God and they do various things in various places they release various things but there's just more angelic activity there's going to be more engagement of even the the, the great cloud of witnesses everybody say amen amen I mean heaven isn't a place where we're all just sitting around finally getting to have and do what we always want to do on the earth that's the way it was usually presented. You're finally going to get all this. No, heaven's going to be a great engagement. I mean, the kingdom, I mean, the kingdom, what we see given of the kingdom right now is going to be outstanding. It already is outstanding. It's going to get more outstanding, the manifestation of the sons of God. But that doesn't stop us from doing things. We get to rule and reign for all eternity with Jesus Christ. If he's done all he's done so far, what in the world is he going to do when it ever he finishes all those things and bam, whole new things are going to be brought in. I mean, I'm looking forward to those things when the power of the kingdom is going to be absolutely exploding into the richness of everything that he wants. And then the understandings of the things that God allows us to see and James Gall's message, you know, that he was seeing with a great crowd of witnesses to finish our work and included, as I said, Gwen Shaw and Derek and his wife and, and Reese and Samuel Howells. In other words, folks, there is a, com a coming together right now 
of every prophetic thing, every promise of God that's ever been spoken, everybody's ever believed in, and God's finding men and women now that's going to perfect and see brought into manifestation and maturity those things that were set in motion by God. And we're alive at that moment to see it happen. Everybody say amen. I mean, God looked ahead before everything and saw you sitting here today. Knowing that you have prepared beforehand for you those good works to accomplish the maturing and the absolute fullness of the stature of Christ within his church in this earth. Everybody say amen. Amen. You were waiting for me to say something else, but I was ready for an amen. I love, I love the word amen. Do you love the word amen? Some people say it's religious. It's not religious. It's, it's the favorite word of the four living creatures. You read that, they just say over and over, amen, amen, amen. They just keep saying, amen, amen, amen. So I love amen, amen, amen. Everybody say it. Yeah. Woo. Woo. Ah, yeah. Here's some years ago. I'm still going up and down those mountains in Bangladesh. This is cool. Woo. And the anointing's getting on me, and the anointing gets on me. My head itches. Amen. Woo. That's why I keep my hair short, because you can't really mess it up. <laughs> Kathy and Flo know me back in the days when every hair on my head was perfect and everything was right in the right place. People used to make fun of me because it was so perfect, but I got tired of it, so. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo! Now I'm having another reminder. Some years ago, two, three, four, probably... God gave me this word that he said this. He said, Sam, to me, and he said, I want you to tell everybody in my church, in my body. He said, I'm getting ready to revisit. For every place that I've ever come to you and marked you. Any place where I've ever, from salvation to healings, to deliverances, to angelic visitations, to mandates, to callings, to whatever. He said, I'm going to come and I'm going to revisit every one of those where I've marked you. Oh. And then he says, and then I'm going to increase it. Woo! Woo! Now follow this. You know what hit me there? If he's going to revisit me with every place he's ever marked me, I, I had that experience once. I know what that produced. I know how it changed me. And it took him 40-some years to do it. And now he's getting ready to come in a, some smaller period of time. And he's doing it. And he's doing some of it right now. He's coming. He's just coming. He's going to revisit you. And I'm going to touch you again. You're going to taste it. You're going to feel it. You're going to know it. You're going to be equipped by it. And then I'm going to increase it. So it means everything he ever did so far to this point, he's going to do it again. I know what that's going to produce. But he said, I'm going to increase it. You know what else that says? He said, at any place I've ever fallen short. Any of you ever fallen short? I have. Any of you have any delays? I have. Any of you just totally failed him? I have. You know what he says? He said, I gave you once a chance. And you didn't quite make it on some of them. But I'm getting ready to come and touch you with it again. And this time I'm going to give you the increase that you'll be able to finish it by my grace and by my power. Shout unto God a big shout. Amen. So I just spoke it over you. So you're going to start having revisits. Amen. I'm having a revisit. One of our leadership conferences, Kathy's so blind. She can't see anything. There's no light, nothing. All these things. And a word came out in this one leadership conference. says, Kathy, I see you lying down in the mud. I see you lying down in the mud and people walking over you, walking over you, walking over you. You've given your life. You laid down so others can walk across where they couldn't walk across and where all those things and multitudes and multitudes are coming and multitudes and multitudes are coming as a result of those intercessions. And everybody say amen. amen. In another one of those leaderships I'd been ministering and all of a sudden I started seeing myself zipping. I don't use that word. I'm zipping. Oh, I'm zipping. And I'm zipping now. Amen. 
The only second time I've ever zipped. I was zipping, and I saw myself zipping around the black stone at Mecca, zipping and zipping and zipping, and all those Muslim nations around that whole geographic area around Israel, I'm zipping and zipping and zipping. And from that moment on, this was just a few years ago, all the more and more people are being visited by Jesus in dreams and in manifestations appearing to the Muslim people because he's taking them all by the power that's in his precious blood. Everybody say amen. 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 Okay. Huh. We, we got past after, we started after five, and I said I would close at five. She said, no, go one hour. So I still have a few more minutes. Amen. So another intercession. You want another intercession? You have to see what other people don't see. You have to hear what other people don't hear. Hallelujah. So once I'm in this leadership meeting and I'm talking about the nations, et cetera, like that, and all of a sudden I, I'm there and I'm pacing down there in front of the people and, and I've been pre- me, me, g- 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 give, giving, yeah, giving this message. And all of a sudden I hear something. Well, if you hear something, If he initiates something, he intends for you to say it. Okay, so I hear this word three times. It's important. If you hear it, it, say it like you hear it. Don't change it. Don't alter it. You can't improve on what God says. Amen? So I I hear, Saha! 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 And I stop just like that. And everybody in the congregation did just what you did. They go, now, I'm famous for saying things like that and never giving any explanation for them. <laughs> so there are people sitting out there going, oh, no, here goes Sam saying those strange words that he doesn't understand. Nobody else understands. So then I hear it again. Saha, saha, saha. I'm going from section to section to section. I don't say anything till I hear it. I could. But why? If he doesn't initiate it, it doesn't have much power. Then I hear, Saha, Saha, Saha. Whew. Then I started up praying in some kind of tongue. And then this interpretation came about the nations and bowing and worshiping, et cetera, like that. Well, here it comes. Thank God for Google. Google makes me into an understandable person. <laughs> so here comes a person carrying their iPhone. They come walking up and they say, I, I Googled the word Saha. Saha is a Hebrew word which means to worship, to bow down, to give adoration, to give Saha, Saha, Saha. So heaven started declaring. Everything's going to bow. So we thought maybe we better bow. So we all go on our faces and various postures, and I'm there on my face, and all of a sudden I'm hearing the voice of one of our international apostolic leaders, and he's getting my attention. And here comes a, a pastor crawling up like a military crawl on his knees, and, his, and he's got his iPhone. And I'm thinking, they just interrupted a real holy moment, Okay. So this pastor, he comes up and he says, look at this. He said, I Googled an Islamic website, or Arabic website, excuse me, Arabic website. Saha is an Arabic word, which also means to worship and to become prostrate, but it has this additional meaning to it. It means this, to do penance for having believed a lie. So over the Jew and the covenant people of God, God was pronouncing, Saha, Saha, Saha. And over those following Islam, God was declaring, you're going to bow because you're going to confess and repent of having believed a lie. Saha, Saha, Saha. Woo! We had two Lebanese pastors sitting in that meeting. They knew what we were saying. 
We just didn't know what we were saying. So do not minimize what you hear in tongues. Do not minimize the word that God would have you say that you do not know the meaning. Do not let the accuser of the brethren tell you you're foolish. No. You have no idea what you may be saying. But you're saying the counsel and the wisdom of heaven itself because that's the spirit of God coming to speak, bringing in the Holy Spirit, searching out the deep things of God to bring forth the intercessions of the Christ to cause them to come into your life. To cause them to be spoken, to cause them to return back out there, not to return to him void. Because see, every time we say, Saha, 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 that word's going out and it's touching people in various countries. You can zip around the black stone. I've been there, okay? You can zip around and you can just absolutely, you, you can zip it and you can say it all as you're going over it. Woo! Just a few weeks ago, I'm doing a conference for another apostolic group, and we're joining with them with our university and because we're starting a seminary in cooperation with Randy Clark. I think maybe I mentioned that. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I was there because this guy's bringing his whole apostolic network into our educational format because he, he wanted to start a university. We have the accreditation. It's a guy with the same DNA. Anyway, I went there. Um, so, who is he? Wesley Campbell had given... A word instruction to people that we were to get in groups about six people and and we were to start praying over people and when we prayed over somebody then that person was to pray over other people and just releasing stirring things up etc like that so this one lady we prayed for and, and i know that in fact she and her husband he has a missionary aviation company it's also coming under our degree program to be able to have a complete mission aviation program it's incredible the things that are happening but anyway so uh, she's a very sharp lady been in ministry missionary in mexico for 35 years and anointed anointed lady anyway she says i have this word for you she says i see you on a white horse oh. And when I, she said that, bam, I go down under the power. And then I find myself going on a horse ride. <sighs> and I'm going on a horse ride. This horse takes off. I don't know where it's going. I didn't ridden a white horse before. But I'm on a white horse in a spiritual experience, seeing, hearing things. I don't, know, I don't want to get off the white horse. I want to go with the white horse. So here at the white horse, it's going, and I realize that we go with this white horse, and it takes and it goes to this nation. And as it enters into this nation, I notice something sort of happening. Angels start coming from every direction, every direction, angels gathering. And they're, they're gathering. That was the word. They're gathering. The angels are gathering. And when the angels would gather in this nation, then we, the horse would take off to another nation. It would go to this other nation. And then, then the angels would come, and they would gather. They were gathering. They were gathering. They, when they would gather, they would just like filling up these nations. And then we'd go to another nation, and they would gather. They would, man, I was exhausted by the time I got up off that. That was a, quite a horse ride. All right? But I saw something. God's gathering the angels for this wonderful, massive harvest in the discipling of the nations of the earth. Amen? He's gathering them. He's gathering them. And since then, I find myself every once in a while, I'll just be back on that horse. I don't think about getting on the horse. I don't try to get on the horse. All of a sudden, I'm on the horse. All right? He's a good God that absolutely wants us to engage in these things. And for, I mean, I, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm going to hear, you can, I'll, I'll give you the report, but I mean, I'm going to hear some new villages and the mountains and the hill tracks of Bangladesh that are getting ready to come to Jesus Christ. Because as we shouted out that word, that word is living, that word is active, that word is going out. And God is engaging all of those things again. I just saw it, man, and experienced it and felt it by His grace and by His power. Wow. Woo! Did we get anything? Oh, good. <laughs> One more story. I was in the nation of Wales some years ago. It's very frustrating to me. Rails, so visited by revival. Clay Nash that is here, his encounters with 
Evan Roberts that I want to hear more about, but Evan Roberts, the Mariah Chapel, where that revival broke out, and probably many of us have been there. But it always frustrates me. There was so much of a move of God that touched that nation in 1904. And the nation is so oblivious right now to God. And right in front of that chapel is a bus stop. And I sat out there one day, and we watched people get on the bus, off the bus, and there's this memorial to Evan Roberts, and most of them have no clue who he is. But if you are sensitive, you know, if you drive into that valley and come up to Locker where that Mariah Chapel is, you just, you just feel God hovering. If you've ever been there, you know, it's just like he's there. He's hovering. He's like, he's like he's brooding, hovering. And when that day as I stood there, I said, God, it's very frustrating. You're here. I know you're here. How? How do we get you? To move from there to once again back down here where you move from village to village and people were engaged in how, what are we going to do with this revival? How are we going to, I mean, they were being moved. I mean, people that didn't want anything to do with God had to get saved. And you know the stories. Incredible presence of God. Journalists kept track and they put it in the papers. The revival went here to this village, turned right. Didn't go left, turned right. Then it would go away and it would go left. And they were tracking it. It's how tangible it was. I said, God, it's so frustrating. How do we get you to move? You're here. I know. I feel you. I know you. So that night, walking the floor of this house where I was staying, walking the floor, playing in tongues, see if God speak, speak, God. What do you what say something, God? What do, you, what do you have to say? Tell me. What I need to hear right now, you know what's inside of me. What do I need to hear? And I heard him say, turn to Genesis 1-1. Well, I know Genesis 1-1. You know Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens, the earth, and it goes on with that whole thing. And it says this, it says, and then I realized, hovering, that's what I was feeling. Then I realized, it says that God was hovering, he was brooding. The Ruach Elohim, the breath of God, was brooding over all that was there and wasn't there. Here it was and all of that. It was, here, here he was, that dynamic energy moving God, brooding, all that happens in that realm. I mean, it's not like he's just kind of static up there. It's just, there's this force. There's this power. There's this anointing. And then it says this, Ruach Elohim. And then the Hebrew word, I looked it up, Rakoff, brooding. Ruach Elohim, the breath of God was there, brooding, Rakoff. And then the word hayah, to be, hayah. And then it says, and God said, this God, the spirit of the living God, he says, let there be light. And there was light. So I said, here you are. You're it was like, okay, hayah what? Let there be what? That's my question. What's it going to take to get you down here? What is it we need to engage in? What do you need us to believe? What do you need us to declare? What do you need us to pray? Hayah, and I would literally, I was lying. By this time I was on my face. I was Ruach Elohim, Rakoff, I see you, I feel you, I sent you now. Haya, let there be, let there be what? It was like there was something else. Let there be what? And I started hearing this word. Let there be Samada. Samada. What's Samada? I don't know what it is, but I know heaven said it. Let there be Samada. Let there be Samada became my word. So for the next hours, I paced the floor and I said, Let there be. Ruach Elohim. Rakoff. Haya Samada. Haya Samada. Haya Samada. The next morning in the church that I was ministering in, that was my message. Haya Samada. <laughs> Don't have a clue what it means, but we're supposed to say it. Samada. I get back home and I share Haya Samada with our church. Don't have a clue what it means, I tell him. But he's going to tell us. It's a mystery. It's a mystery coming out of heaven. It's the word of God spoken to go out, not to return empty, not to return void. Haya Samada. Several weeks went by. 
in a Sunday night service, I'm standing there worshiping God, and God said, I'm getting ready to tell you what Samada means. Okay. And I hear, you've been saying, let there be. Haya, let there be. Let there be reaping. R-E-A-P-I-N-G. Let there be reaping. And immediately I thought of, God reminded me, whatever, Revelation 14, the one coming in clouds, the golden crown upon his head, with a sickle in his hand. And the angel announces, put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. So God had been declaring, not just me, not just with the authority that God gives us to pray and declare things, but heaven initiated Samada. Heaven initiated that I am there wanting to permeate, wanting to break down, looking for those who will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and all that goes into those things and make the confessions of what God wants and sing the songs that, that Claren had us singing the other night about the breath of God and the four winds and, and the wind coming and the breath of God. I mean, I, years ago, God said to me, he said, read that Ezekiel passage. I did. He said, has it totally been fulfilled yet? I said, no. He said, are you still speaking to the breath? I thought, no. Now I have some prayer. Yeah, Holy Spirit comes in. No, he said, prophesy. We need to be living in the power of the word of God. God said to Ezekiel, you prophesy to the breath. You prophesy to the four winds. Come. Come, breath of God. Come. Come. From the four winds and breathe on these slain that they may live. We need to prophesy that. We need to be speaking it and prophesying it day by day. Amen. Everybody get up and shout unto God. Everybody say, Haya Samada. Haya Samada. Haya Samada. Okay, and if God so does it, you have my permission to go zipping. <laughs> if God so does it, you have my permission to ride a white horse. Amen. Woo! Gosh, I love you guys. I love you guys that love God and believe God, and thank you for allowing me to come. Sharon, Philip, thank you so much. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Have you been empowered? Ha. You may be seated for just a moment. We won't tarry long, but I just, a couple of things from what he shared that I, I just want to highlight. As end time handmaidens and servants, Our theme scripture from the book of Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, quoting the book of Joel chapter 2, 28 and 29. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh in the last days. In the last days, where are we now? Obviously, we're here because we understand this is the last days. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and upon my servants, I'm sorry, I'm leaving some out, upon my servants and upon my handmaidens will I pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. What you just said about has it been fulfilled yet? Then prophesy. I've, been, I've really been seeking the Lord about what do you really want us to be doing and prophesying? And I believe that's a key right there. That's a key. The things in the word of God that have not yet been fulfilled, we need to be speaking and declaring and speaking them into existence. Haya Sabada. And Haya, let there be whatever it is that hasn't been yet. Because we do not yet see all things fulfilled. As the word says. But we see Jesus. 
who was made a little lower than the angels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I believe, I believe that God is drawing a line in the sand in this convention. That we are moving forward into a new place. And what he said about, about revisiting. Some of us got our calls many years ago. God's going to revisit. God's going to revisit. And, and uh, Pastor Sam, I want to tell you that when we were, when Philip and I were watching your DVD, DVDs from your time with us in, in Engeltal, and I'm sorry I didn't think to have, I thought about it. I'm sorry I didn't act on it to have them make some sets to have available to you, but to order them at the bookstore because his teachings there were tremendous, absolutely tremendous. You said something in that time about revisiting, just like you said at this time. And I thought back, it was in April when, when we were watching this. It happened to be April 17th. <clears throat> and I thought back to the time when my sister in, invited, my sister was attending the Dorns Church at the time. And she invited me the first time to come and hear these ladies that smuggle Bibles. And that was in the fall of, of uh, 75. And I thought that was pretty interesting, so I wanted to go and hear these ladies. And Siggy spoke that morning. And all I could do was cry. I didn't know why I was crying. But I knew that there was something that had to do with those ladies that had something to do with me. I was praying and thinking that if I just sat there crying long enough, they would come and lay hands on me and prophesy and tell me what it is that, that I'm not getting. They didn't. The next time they showed up in the area, my sister, I had just had my 18th birthday, and that's how I know I could, could track this. I had just had my 18th birthday sometime during the week. And on that Saturday, my sister says, I want to take you out to lunch for your birthday. So she takes me to a luncheon that Sister Dorn was hosting where Sister Gwen was the main speaker. I'm sitting there listening to Sister Gwen speak, and I hear the voice of the Lord say, I want you, I want you 100%, and I want you right now. You know, I've reviewed that in my mind a number of times. And at the time, I thought I understood it. Ha, 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 ha. And through the years, when I've reviewed it, I've come up to a whole new understanding about what 100% means. And that night, after we watched that, I thought, I wonder when that was. And I went, thank God for, you know, like you said, thank God for Google. I went back in my phone to what, what day of the week was it when I had that experience? Because it would have been the Saturday after the 14th of April, 1976. I went back to the 1976 calendar, and it was the 17th of April, 40 years later, 40 years to the day God revisited me on that, and, and I had to ponder again, what does 100% mean? And every time I ponder it, it goes deeper. God wants to continue to revisit us. And I believe in this convention, he's revisiting those things, those areas in our lives, those calls, those, those visitations that we've had. So be sensitive to that as we continue through the, through the next very few meetings. This is almost over, you know. Once you get to Wednesday, it's just, real, whew, it's gone. And this is Thursday. It's almost over. But God wants to revisit us. And he wants to dig, redig those wells. He wants to bring forth fresh water, fresh fountains, fresh springs of living waters. He wants to unstop the wells and, and bring us back into the thing that we could have done back then that we didn't quite do quite right. Only now we're better equipped. We're older, we're wiser, we can do this.
And it's not too late for us to obey again. Father, thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this teaching. We bless Pastor Sam in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless him. We bless him. We bless him. We bless the relationship that is being built in the spirit for eternal purposes, for the eternal purposes of the kingdom of God. We bless this relationship in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we, we say thank you for what you are doing in each one of us, that, that you're leading us into the deeper understanding and knowledge of what we're supposed to do in these end times to prophesy the things that have not yet come to pass and speak them into being and believe them into being, speaking those things that are not as though they were. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you. Have a good break. We'll be back here at 7.